Barnegat Bay is uh, unique. It's a beautiful bay to look at. Beyond looking at it, it needs help. These shallow estuaries are particularly susceptible to pollution. Everybody has to get involved. Once they do one thing, everybody's going to start doing it. Barnegat Bay is an estuary located in Ocean County, New Jersey. The bay is about 40 miles long and 4 miles wide. This space of land here, prior to development being put on, it actually moved around quite a bit because these are basically large sand dunes and every storm that would come by would actually change the topography, would change the landscape. But if we were to leave it alone, this piece of land would be constantly changing. Different inlets would be cut in because of uh, the wave action and the way that weather erodes away sand. The reason why the, the Barnegat Bay Peninsula looks the way it does now is because we put things like roads and seawalls in to keep it here. This is an old map of New Jersey, but it shows, it, it reminds you about the 526 miles of shoreline that we have. And then here's the famous Barnegat Inlet and Barnegat Bay, which is the largest body of water in New Jersey. Barnegat Bay is uh, unique. It's an inland estuary, and it's also a lagoonal estuary. And lagoonal estuaries are, uh, are a particularly rare sort of version of estuaries because they're really shallow. And these shallow estuaries are particularly susceptible to pollution because they're highly productive. Uh, light, it makes it all the way from the surface down to the bottom. And so plants can grow that entire area through the water column. You were fed by a river, the Matitakong, another river, the Toms River, or the Wawapuma, and then the Forked River. So we had wonderful freshwater oysters, clams, shrimp, seafood that was greatly delicate. And there were 78 Indian tribes living on the shores of Barnegat Bay. And when we were young, we caught anything that moved and could be sold in Barnegat Bay. I guess I might have been somewhere around 16 years old, and I would get a call in Seaside Park, and uh, would Roger bring a bushel of oysters there? And I was, I'd say to my family, I'll see you in a half hour. And it would take me 20 minutes to dig a full bushel of oysters. The estuary here at Barnegat Bay is uh, very unique because there's only three outlets to the ocean and there's only several large freshwater sources. In the summertime, it can take as much as 74 days for water to move from the northern portion of the bay out to the ocean. So that's really important to this ecosystem because anything that we put in the water remains here for a long period of time. I've been on Barnegat Bay about 60 years. I live right on the shores of Barnegat Bay, 40 feet over it, fortunately. But uh, it's been a wonderful bay in my life and uh, no place I'd rather be. However, Barnegat Bay has shown a marked decline over the years. I came down in 1936 when the railroad was running through and then I came down I spent most of the time in Point Pleasant because this was nothing down here really. But then came the 1950s and the Garden State Parkway. And then things just pop blossomed. It turned into almost a, a bedroom community where people could commute back up. In fact, there used to be a little pond diagonally across my house where I used to ice skate. And then they filled it up and put houses there. Over the past few decades, there's been a huge amount of development in Ocean County. The local people found the marshes weren't being used anymore. Very much salt hanging was going out and things like that. So they, they bought the marshes rather cheaply and they dug lagoons up there and with the fill they piled it up on top of the marsh and then they built, built these very modest homes which they advertised you could buy for the cost of your daily paper. Arnegat Bay has suffered very heavily from an overpopulation of people and a misuse. There's been very poor environmental protection. There's been almost no enforcement. Uh, these are very, very valuable marshes. They're really the heart of Arnegat Bay there would provide a lot of the nutrients into the bay to make the bay what it was or what it is. So here Barnegat Bay is one body of water, but all of the water that runs into it from other places around here is considered the watershed. So rivers as far away as Jackson and New Jersey are sources of water that come into here. There's a definite need to get into Barnegat Bay with scientists and find out what the problems are, not just one. You want to study the whole thing as a unit and then be able to come up and say, well, this is what we have, now what are we going to do? Is there anything we can do? Can anything be done about Barnegat Bay?
back in the 25s when it was really tough down here. This was concentrated hunting and recreation, clamming and crabbing and getting herring, all types of livelihoods that the small town people lived on. When I started in the early mid 70s, I mean, you would go out in the bay any particular morning and, uh, you know, there'd be a hundred or so guys out there clamming and crabbing and seining and bait fish. Well, over the years, baymen have been uh, people that persevere through whether it be weather or development or whatever, and uh, so that's, that's the kind of people we are. The uh, freedom that working on the water gives you. You know, you don't do it for the money, you do it because you love to do it. Probably the biggest difference in the bay we've seen over 30, 35 years is the depletion of hard clams. There's not really a wild fishery anymore. There were oysters all over the bottom of this bay. There were clams all over this bay. At one point, not too many years ago, there were 900 commercial clamors on this bay. There are nine now. They just can't make it here. We can't make it anymore because the shellfish have been so depleted. They used to do a lot of eel fishing over by Beaton's and I don't see that anymore. I used to see a truck come in, a refrigerator truck, and they would load up eels. Oysters and clams filter water. One two-inch oyster, this is about an inch and a half, one two-inch oyster can filter about 50 gallons of water a day. So if you have tens of thousands or perhaps millions of oysters, you're going to clean the bay. What's over my shoulder is the basic energy system that really feeds the ocean. These are the nursery areas and it goes out to sea. We can actually tra trace that energy flow right up to giant swordfish, tuna, and whales. So it's all connected. Estuaries are some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Uh, the important thing about estuaries is lots of the species of commercial fish that we look for to keep an industry alive actually spend a portion of their life here in the bay. So things like striped bass and menhaden, which are a bunker that we have offshore here, live for a short period of their life here in the bay and sometimes live in all of it. These are important spawning grounds and these are crucial ecosystems in terms of keeping larger ecosystems like the ocean around. talk about pollution, there's two different types. There's point source and non-point source pollution. We're really lucky here in Barnegat Bay because we don't actually have point sources. What Barnegat Bay suffers from the most is this thing called non-point source pollution. And this is pollution from lots of different places. Um, in particular, the nitrogen that's coming to the bay, much of that comes from the atmosphere, from fossil fuels that we burn in our cars and in our power plants and, uh, and in industry. And subsequently, more of that comes from uh, lawn fertilizers and agricultural fertilizers, pet waste. And as that stuff accumulates in the environment, it sort of seeps into the bay from all the different sources bringing water here, rain and stormwater, groundwater, and runoff. And as that moves these non-point source pollutants into the system, we ultimately end up with a large load of this stuff coming in and causing the problems that we're seeing here. With the population came the boats. The people wanted docks, down went the docks with pre assorted pilings and they wanted the mosquitoes control. Of course, the mosquito commissions then were nearly as effective as they are today, and they were spreading DDT at a fantastic level, and it was really destroying the life in the bay and on the marsh, particularly things like the uh, fiddler crab, which fed on top of the marsh, and it picked up the DDT, and when the birds ate that, that to kill the birds. And many of the species became extinct. They cut down the trees, of course, for the houses, and that eliminated a lot of the nesting birds, and the, the people floated in by the thousands, literally thousands. So the bay actually only covers about 44 miles of coast, but the entire watershed is roughly 660 square miles. It's much, much bigger. And that's one of the things that's really important to realize about these systems, is that it's not just the bay that is, uh, is at the center of this, it's actually a larger system of waterways. Eutrophication is sometimes described as the aging of an ecosystem in freshwater. Here, eutrophication is more connected with pollution. In this area where we are in an estuary, a com which is a combination of salt and fresh water, nitrogen is the big culprit. This nitrogen is really, really creating havoc because of the eelgrass and all the other submerged aquatic vegetations that were really important in the bay and still are, but have been basically shaded out or covered by, smothered literally 
by these algae. Here, we have a, a lot of algae and things like that that grow normally in these waters, but when you start to pollute them with, uh, with an overloading of nutrients, ultimately that uh, productivity increases and the, uh, the ecosystem starts to fail. In this fertilization of the bay is what's happened. It's making these algae and plants grow. It's nourishing them. And when they do, when these algae grow, they cover the eelgrass beds like a rug would cover your lawn. And when you take up a rug off your lawn, you've got yellow grass or dead grass. It's the same thing in the bay. So the small rooting plants and uh, things like clams that would normally live in that ecosystem now can't because they're covered by this detritus, this dead material that is coating the bottom of the bay. And that habitat's an important spawning ground for uh, flounder and fluke and uh, many of the species of commercial fish that we rely on here in the bay. The eelgrass was down south of Lavalette and it was so high, it was coming right up to the top and now it's gone. I can't understand what happened to that. It just disappeared. Remove that eelgrass, you've taken the habitat away and you have nothing to start out. Here's the eelgrass, that's the healthy stuff that should be rooted in the bottom and here's the intestinalis that you can see is floating on the surface. Here's another one of the culprits, it's just drifting by. This is a brown algae, and this one is growing right now. We're in the middle of August, and so this one is coming up, and you'll see this covering over the strands of eelgrass. And so it's becoming a problem because, again, it's shading out the eelgrass. The eelgrass is rooted, so it has to go down, the nitrogen has to go down into the soil and then come up through the roots. This takes it directly, this takes it indirectly. So this grass, the eelgrass, has a much harder time than this brown algae. We're looking at algae on eelgrass, or we're rather we're looking at the frequency and distribution of blue claw crabs or, or soft clams. You know, there is a linkage between that and the quality of human life. A lot of the nitrogen that we don't want to see comes from non-point sources, sewers, street drainage, things that go right directly into the bay. That's all the water that's coming into this bay for Barnegat Bay, and it's the Toms River, it's the Matitaconk, it's all these rivers that are draining in. And people in Jackson, by the amusement park, don't realize that the fertilizer on their lawn is running into the bay and is causing problems for clams and oysters, for these shellfish that we're talking about. It's the major housing developments that come to the shore. And people are using tremendous amounts of fertilizer on their lawns. Uh, the whole western side of the county have these very beautiful homes up there. And those people don't care about the environment. They want to see a green lawn. And they're putting it on at excessive rates. It, the ground can't absorb it, and it goes down right into the bay. And there's no question in neutrifying the bay. So there's a need to really control that. We have to make sure that we don't have excess nitrogen. And you do when you plant trees, shrubs, flowers that are not native. They need extra help, extra care. So the school is right next to the bay, so I thought native plants would be perfect because if we use fertilizers and like other products that aren't good, it could run off into the bay, which can poison our environment. If you go to Nantucket, you don't find anybody out there with a lawnmower or spreading fertilizer because they can't do it. And I think that model is going to be important, you know, when we look at Barnegat Bay. Technically, there's no reason to put fertilizer on lawn. It's a beautiful bay to look at. But beyond looking at it, it needs help. Some things that you can do uh, to help the problem here, we've been talking about nitrogen pollution a lot, would be, uh, one thing would be to cut your energy usage. When you go home, switch your light bulbs to some, uh, some compact fluorescents, which use much less energy. That'll cut down on the atmospheric nitrogen that's falling into the bay in the rainwater. Also, ride your bike instead of driving. That way you can also reduce that type of pollution. And watch the types of lawn fertilizers that you use. You want the lawn fertilizers to have a high percentage of slow-release nitrogen. And that nitrogen stays in the lawn, it fertilizes the grass, and it doesn't uh, leach into the groundwater. You want to watch your pet waste, make sure that you uh, clean up your pet waste and make sure that doesn't go into the drain. And in terms of non sporting source pollution, there's also things like uh, rubbish and trash. So re recycle, keep your trash in designated containers, and 
that'll be great steps towards reducing uh, pollution. Everybody has to get involved. Everybody that's got a lawn, everybody that has a garden, everybody that has a golf course or anything like that. We're all members of the sort of the greater environment here, the ecosystem. So each individual is able to contribute to a larger solution and a greater solution by just taking small actions, like limiting the amount of pollution that comes out of your yard. I use no chemicals. Um, we live right on the bay and this would not be the environment that you would want to put anything on the soil that would affect the ecosystem uh, that is so delicate and fragile and so beautiful. The best possible option is to plant native species which don't need any fertilizer, which should have grown here in the first place. Like, lawns do not belong in this environment. This is not a lawn kind of place. Every area has their own natives uh, that will survive in the particular conditions of the area. They didn't have fertilizer. They didn't have added water when it didn't rain. They are survivors. They've survived all this time and they will continue to survive. There's bayberry, there's a bunch of them. There's like, they're all great. They don't need any fertilizers, pesticides. They don't need a lot of watering. So it's good because we don't need to do all that. The schools are working on rain gardens. The garden clubs are working on rain gardens. And the native plant societies which are very active, are working on rain gardens. So we know it's a good thing, that it's something that is definitely going to help. You know, I think that native plant approach, and I've recommended this to Save Barnegat Bay, as being one of the philosophies that we should start to weave into the communities. It's a complex problem. It took a long time to develop. It's going to take a while to fix. But if we're all working together, we can do it. It's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of public support. Right now, it's, it's a stepchild. If you don't put money in the bay, you aren't going to get a return. We're all doing this. It's not just a nuclear power plant. It's not just a chemical plant. It's not just a sewer. It's us. It's the people here. And that's why I get excited about education, because that's what I do. And as an educator, I'm trying to get the young people to understand that. And young people are getting it. Teaching the basic uh, understanding of an ecosystem. We can do it with Cub Scouts, we can do it in kindergarten. In fact, that's some of the places where our time is best spent as professors. The children just embrace this situation and they are so knowledgeable. Well, I hope to see more schools having native plants so then the world would be a lot cleaner, the oceans, the lakes, the bays and our world will be really healthy because of the native plants. It's time to go to the younger people because they are the ones that are listening. They know what has to be done. Save Bonnie Bay, I think, is probably the most wonderful citizen activist organization in the whole state of New Jersey. Certainly it is in Ocean County. They have fought off the developers, they have developed in wonderful ways. The western shore, keeping it natural. They have cleanups. It took a lot of people to mess up this bay. It's going to take a lot of people helping it to get it better. If everybody did something small, we'd all be a larger portion of the solution. And so everybody's individual actions are important to helping this ecosystem. One person can really make a difference because once they do one thing, everybody's going to start doing it. We have to take responsibility ourselves and not leave it to the government to make laws for everything. Just do it. <laughs> I'm just one person. What could that mean? It means everything. It means every single individual has an ability to do what they need to do to make sure that it's a better planet. Now there's a story that's told how the pirates of old had sailed into Barnegat Bay. And when old Captain Kidd, he sought a way to get rid of the gold he had hoarded away. So he took from his hold all the great chest of gold and he buried them deep on the shore. And he went sailing away from his treasure in bay to the old Spanish main for more. And then they said, there's one spot that I know where I'm longing to go, one place where I'm aiming to stay, and whatever I do, I'll be pining for you. Old Barney, dear Barney, fair Barney, get bay. Oh, was that more? That was that. So much better. Was that, what, that was how could it be better than perfect? <laughs> <laughs>